Yeah, let's start now. Uh, I'll start by sharing my screen. Uh, we'll give an introduction to Devopedia and speakers, and then Arjun will take over from me. I'm sharing my screen. One second. Yes. The introduction about Devopedia. First, let's start there. So, Devopedia is a community and platform. We have about a strong community of uh, 5,000 people we had. Uh, now, a lot of people contribute to our platform. So, Devopedia is a platform which is uh, supposed to share, which is meant to share uh, knowledge to the developers. And this is maintained by developers and for developers. So, the idea is to collect articles, basically crowdsource articles to our platform. Uh, I invite uh, all of you to uh, contribute articles to this platform. And a brief history about this Devopedia is um, Arvind started this platform about four years ago, somewhere close to four years ago. And I joined as a trustee uh, with Arvind. And there are two other trustees. Uh, so I recommend each of you to use this platform to expand your knowledge base and also contribute uh, and get the due credit uh, for you. We have some uh, rewards program for writers also. Please look for it and sign up. That is the brief introduction about Devopedia. And uh, what I see is uh, uh, today uh, a lot of uh, today, tomorrow, the talks are related to most of the talks are related to machine learning. And one talk is with respect to engineering. So to all the machine learning interested folks, we already have quite a lot of topics uh, in the Devopedia platform. One such is NLP. You can see the variety of topics in NLP. Uh, so please go through these topics, share it with your friends, and uh, consider contributing from your end as well. So the, there is a wide variety of topics in natural language processing, statistics, data science, machine learning. Uh, please make use of this platform and uh, Whenever possible, please contribute it. That's the introduction about the uh, platform. Now let's go to the talk. So today's talk is on the 10 a.m. talk is on Bayesian inference. So we will be uh, building up to the Bayesian inference. We'll start very basic probability and slowly build it to the Bayesian inference, Bayesian theorem and Bayesian formula and how to infer the Bayesian uh, uh, outputs. Uh, again, I'm saying we are starting from the basics. Please uh, uh, involve. Uh, this has to be an involved uh, listening. Don't do a casual listening. There are going to be a lot of numbers, a lot of uh, uh, you know equations. Uh, if you uh, involve yourself into the slides, read into the slides, you will get the maximum out of it. Uh, so. Uh, Please uh, get the maximum out of this presentation. This is a very interesting topic, but we'll need some amount of involvement from each of you. So this one uh, I will be presenting along with Arjun. Arjun will give the basics. Um, you know, he will build up from basic probability to the Bayesian probabilities, and then I will take over from there and then give you some more advanced uh, uh, concepts in Bayesian. Uh, and that I hope is good introduction for this. Um, I will I'll ask Arjun to take over the screen and share the uh, slides, please, Arjun. Yes, Arjun has taken over. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. So we are looking at Bayesian inference today. I'll start with the basics. So my first slide will be a brief history of this Bayesian philosophy. The theorem and the philosophy are named after 
a Presbyterian minister, Reverend Thomas Bass, who was alive in the 18th century. He never published his work. So his, uh, uh, during his lifetime, uh, uh, nothing much uh, got contributed to the field. But after his death, his work was published by Richard Price. And uh, lots of work was built upon the basic theories proposed by Thomas Bayes. And the broad interpretation of Bayesian was popularized by Pierre Sam, uh, Simon Laplace. This is the same person who is known for Laplace transforms and many other discoveries in maths. So Bayesian philosophy allows the application of probability to all sorts of propositions. The uh, as opposed to a frequency and in its present sense, it has been used since the 1950s. And it is at the core of almost every modern estimation approach, including condition possibilities like uh, sequential estimation, machine learning techniques, risk assessment, localization and mapping. And uh, more than a formula, this is a philosophy. It gives us a system to revise probabilities based on new evidences. So we will uh, consider a small example in the next slide. Uh, just to go from basic probability towards base. Here we have a chocolate vending machine where there are two types of chocolates, brand A and brand B. Both brands have two types of chocolates, crunchy and spongy. And uh, in this, uh, what we see on the screen is brand A. So probability of crunchy uh, in brand A is basically number of crunchy chocolates by to total number of chocolates. That is 0.63. And uh, probability of spongy in brand A is 0.37. Similarly, we see this calculated for brand B. In brand B, it's equally distributed. You have 20 spongy and 20 crunchy. So you have 0.5 uh, probability for spongy given B. Now we look at the whole vending machine. So this has brand A and brand B together. Now, the more the correct way of writing this is like this P of crunchy given A is 0.63. P of spongy given A is 0.37. This A is fixed and it's called deterministic. And the choice that is crunchy or spongy is called the probabilistic. This vertical line between them is uh, when you read it out is called given or conditional. Now, whatever we saw on the previous slide is represented as a contingency table here. Uh, it's easy to make out these numbers. And uh, the last row and last column has the totals. So here we have 45 total number of crunchy sponges. 35, total number of brand A is 40, total number of brand B is 40. And total number of chocolates in the vending machine is 80. So uh, if we find the uh, total probability of crunchy chocolates in the vending machine, you take the tot uh, total number of crunchy chocolates divided by total number of chocolates, you get 0.56. Similarly, you can calculate for spongy. Now this table here is called the row relative frequency contingency table. So that is uh, probability of crunchy given A. So you fix A and you calculate number of uh, crunchy chocolates. So that is 25 by 40. This is 0.625. And the other three are also calculated like that. 
15 by 40, 20 by 40 and 20 by 40. So we will use this now to calculate the total probability of crunching. We have selected P of A and P of B as 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Uh, that is the uh, based on the total number of A divided by total number of chocolates. So you just multiply this, you get probability of A and crunchy plus probability of B and crunchy. You add them up, you get the total probability of crunchy. Now this uh, table here is called the column relative frequency table. And that is uh, basically representing probability of the brand A when the type of chocolate is fixed, that is crunchy. So that is uh, got by dividing 25 by this number, 25 by 45. And similarly for the other three. So this formula right here is the base formula. This In this slide, we'll give a brief introduction to prior and posterior possibilities, probabilities. If a choice is crunchy, what is the probability that the customer will choose brand A? That is, crunchy is the determinant. And uh, what is the probability that the customer will choose A? So that is probability of A and crunchy divided by total probability of crunchy. This denominator is the total probability of crunchy. That is 55.75. Here we have selected the prior to be 0.5 and 0.5, that is P of A and P of B. Always they add up to one. And the posterior here that is calculated with this, with this given prior is 0.55 and 0.44. Just by plugging the values into the equation. This slide shows that equation in detail with everything explained. The LHS of the equation, that is P of A given choice, is called the posterior. And the RHS, this term P of A is the prior. That is basically the probability a hypothesis is true before any evidence is present then p of choice given a is likelihood or evidence of the choice given that a is opted that is probability of seeing the evidence if the hypothesis is true and the denominator here is called the normalizing factor or marginalization that is probability of observing this evidence This formula comes from the Bayes theorem. Now, in the previous slides, we used priors of 0.5 and 0.5. Now, in an objective scenario, let us say we have some market share data that indicates that uh, people prefer brand A, 70% of the people prefer brand A, uh, the market share of brand A is 70% and the market share of brand B is 30%, probably in a country. And uh, we use that 0.7 and 0.3 as the prior and we calculate the posterior, but just by plugging these values into the equation in the previous slide. Similarly, we can use a different type of prior that is based on data from a single shop where they found that uh, only 10% of the people buy brand A chocolates while 90% of the people buy brand B chocolates. Again, plugging in these values into the formula in the previous page, you get the posterior probabilities. So Bayesian philosophy basically states that uh, initial belief plus new evidence is equal to new and improved belief. 
So that is captured here under the Bayesian revision slide. So we start off with priors of A and B as 0.5 and 0.5. And given new evidence, that is the market share 0.7 and 0.3, we plug these values into the equation, the Bayes equation here, and we get the new values here. Now the next stage of revision, you get new evidence from store sales that 10% uh, uh, of the people buy uh, brand A chocolate and 90% of the people buy brand B chocolate. Then you again revise it and you get the new posterior. So this can go on multiple times uh, till you achieve uh, the numbers you want. Now I would hand over to Ramanathan to explain these concepts with data and in a more detailed manner. Thanks, Arjun. So uh, people, I'm allowing mic for all of you. If you have any questions so far, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask the questions. We'll clarify the uh, doubts and then we'll go. You can unmute yourself. No questions at all? Is everything clear with respect to Bayes, the formula, the revision? So fine, uh, in that case, we'll move on. Uh, I will start from uh, this slide. Okay, so uh, the, the crux of Bayes is you have a prior information and you have a new evidence. Use this two to arrive at something called a new pro posterior probabilities. That's the crux of Bayes. Uh, so uh, there are many ways to apply this Bayes. One way is to apply for each of the choice. You have a prior probability and you get posterior probability depending on what your choice is. Or if you don't want to do it for the choice, you have prior information. Uh, if, if you have no idea, you assume equal probabilities. Use the new information and arrive at the new probabilities and use this for your decision making and you know, business decision making. That's the idea. Uh, so far, we uh, learned how to apply uh, Bayes for probabilities. Uh, so since Bayes is a philosophy more than a formula, uh, we can apply for all the kind of statistics. Uh, so why not for mean? Let's see what is how is mean estimated uh, with, before Bayes or uh, ignoring Bayes. So all of us know what mean is. Mean is an average number that describes a data set. And uh, the mean estimate is a simple arithmetic on a large sample of data set. What is the arithmetic? Everyone knows, right? It's a summation of all the sample divided by the total number of samples. That's what the mean is. So what is uh, strange about it? We have been calculating mean day in and day out in all of our uh, daily uh, use cases. Uh, but uh, we are ignorant of some of the assumptions, the mean which we calculate Poses. So we have taken a large sample, let's call that in sample. And if we take a sample outside the sample which we calculated the mean, uh, should the mean remain same or can the mean vary? That is the uh, question. So the mean can vary, right? So uh, if the mean is say, let's say 100, uh, it's more likely to be 99 and 101, more likely to be 95 and 105 and less likely to be 80 and 120. So that's where the sigma factor comes in, right? So uh, this is one of the main assumptions. Though we take a large sample and calculate a mean, we don't stick to that mean always. We give some room to play with, and that room to play with is what is uh, you know, uh, described in this normal distribution curve. 
that is a nice assumption and uh, with the normal distribution curve or for that matter any assumed distribution curve we can calculate confidence intervals p values uh, alpha beta type 1 error type 2 errors we can calculate all uh, all the metrics from the distribution right so the the underlying thing is the assumption that is the keyword and let's say uh, in the inference if any out of sample data mean exceeds the in sample data mean let's say we got if we take a sample and the mean turns out to be 150 that is extreme right side or the extreme left side if the mean turns out to be that we'll blame it on sample we'll call the sample as outlier that is the assumption talks about all the samples should have mean in this plus minus 3 sigma range that is the assumption anything that goes above plus 3 sigma below minus 3 sigma is an anomaly uh, we call it an outlier and then discard that data set discard that sample let us say uh, now if it is one sample that turns out to be an extreme case we will discard it if sample after sample is turning out to be an extreme case what will happen then that is something had to be thought about right so what does that mean of all the recent 10 sample which i have taken i have always uh, ended up as an outlier sample the what does that mean uh, that means the average has got shifted the mean shift has taken place which the mean estimate is not representing the data anymore that is the inference so we cannot call out as anomaly anymore we have to recalculate the mean uh, this is how frequentist approach of the mean estimation has been now let's uh, discuss the challenges uh, one thing is this frequentist approach of the mean estimation is good for or suits for what we call static systems which doesn't change very often uh, static systems uh, not dynamic systems so that's one challenge another challenge is uh, why the out of sample mean uh, should follow a symmetric single peak normal distribution or for that matter any well defined distribution with parameters it can follow any distribution right this is a frequency distribution if you assume in discrete cases all the means of the all the samples need not always follow a smooth or a well defined structure it can have a um, random structure it can have more than one peaks it can be skewed it can be flat it can be pointed it can be anything so this assumption needs to be questioned uh, but a frequentist has its value given this assumption assuming this assumption holds good uh that is a uh, you know frequentist way of looking at mean or inferring the mean now let us see how bayesian approach addresses all these challenges so any questions before we move on people you can unmute i have not uh, uh, muted the mic so you can unmute yourself and ask questions if you have questions uh sir i wanted to uh Uh, get clarification on slide ten again. Like how okay, new data is getting updated? Uh, how new data is getting updated in the slide ten? Uh, yeah. This is the slide ten. Okay. Okay. In the slide ten. Yes. Fine. So uh, let's uh, discuss this for a moment. Uh, we don't have a sufficient information. So point five, point five. We assume people choose brand A with. 50% probability brand b 50% probability that is the assumption now uh, we have a new information from published sources a market pro, uh, brand a has a market share of 70% brand b has a market share of 30% that gives us an idea where the market is leaning towards so uh, from having no idea to having some evidence i end up with some similar evidence similar uh, probabilities the formula is given here so if i can go couple of slides uh, here uh, so the denominator is probability of choosing uh, crunchy okay this slide uh, fine uh, 
if you notice this numbers because here its uh, example is crunchy and spongy so these are the priors what is color coded numbers are priors is that clear and yes. not color coded numbers are evidences 63% evidence supports they choose crunchy 50% evidence supports they choose uh, crunchy in brand b for so 63% evidence supports they choose crunchy in brand a so what is color coded is prior what is not color coded is uh, evidence is that clear yeah and the probability in probability in numerator we have a favorable case denominator we have all exhaustive cases that is the probability Yeah. So, if you want probability of A given crunchy, the first uh, value is the favorable case among the two cases. And I put that in the numerator and I calculate the posterior. Is this calculation clear? Then you should be comfortable with what is happening here. So, these two are priors. These two are evidences. the denominator has the exhaustive possibilities prior times evidence for all of the cases and the numerator has the uh, the favored possibility right so we wanted the uh, probability of a we multiply 0.5 by 0.7 we wanted probability of b we multiply 0.5 by 0.3 so we ended up with see without having a notion we assumed 0.5 0.5 when we have an evidence we result we ended up with same uh posterior probability now this is the global market share uh, how do now that my store my locality preference could be different in the locality probably probably uh, you know brand a is not favored brand b is favored that i come to know from my store sales so i revise the pr probability which i have at hand that is 0.7 0.3 with new evidence and end up with this new posterior if you notice uh, though my store sales says only 10% prefer uh, brand a uh, accounting for the global factors i revise my probability to 0.2 and uh, in this case i am revising the probability from 0.9 to 0.8 so if my store sales gives it say let's say in the forthcoming months the next month or the month after my store sales exhibits change in the behavior i will again use that behavior find a new posterior that time probably it may be 0.3 and 0.7 so uh, this is the idea is that clear yes sir thank you very much so uh, probability is always denominator has exhaustive list of cases and uh, numerator has the favorable list of cases uh, that's what we are doing in bayes denominator is all about prior and evidence and both numerator and denominator is all about prior and evidence so uh, that's what is happening here in this case uh, we chose the example giving the choice right probability of crunchy given a crunchy given b and uh, uh, b also is probabilistic so hence both we multiply them is that clear so okay wait okay. i'll move to the slide so sorry so uh, any other questions in bayes philosophy or mean estimation in the frequentist approach all of you understand what are the challenges in the frequentist approach what are the advantages here now let's uh, go to the bayesian approach of mean estimation we are calculating average we are not doing anything more than that average formula still remains same we are discussing the philosophies two philosophies one is frequentist and another is bayesian okay oh. yeah so bayesian what it does is uh, we saw the first statement in the frequentist approach the estimate is done on a large sample now in bayesian if you don't have large sample that is fine even if you have no data that is fine the mean can be absorbed from reliable sources or calculated from whatever little data that is at our disposal 
and we can call it a prior mean. It's the same. What did we do with the probabilities? When we have no idea, we took uniform probabilities. Here we call something as a prior mean. Good. And we can assume the prior mean distribution. Why prior mean alone? Let's say mean is 100. Uh, we can assume a normal distribution for mean, like frequentist do, or any distribution, beta distribution or uniform distribution, uh, any distribution for the mean we can assume. That's that's good. First advantage of using the Bayesian. We don't need always a large data set to calculate a mean. And as new evidence emerges, let's say we have a mean of 30, and in a new sample, I get a mean of 35. So should I revise the mean as 35? Uh, Bayesian doesn't uh, appreciate that. What does it do is it takes, it says, you take the prior mean and the new evidence, aggregate that. So we have a prior mean of 30, we have a new mean of 35, evidence of 35. I will adjust both and call it 32.5 as my new mean. So this aggregation uh, can be done in multiple ways. Uh, we call it algorithms. One way to do is uh, we'll give more weightage to the latest mean and the less weightage to the old mean. And that is one way of aggregating. What, what will that achieve? That will achieve the change in the average behavior in the mean. That will capture the change in the average behavior in the mean. So you don't have to wait for all the outliers to come and understand all the recent 10 averages are not in expected lines and calculate the mean. So you are correcting the mean as and when the dynamics change. So uh, there are many algorithms to decide on the right posterior mean. What we calculated the new mean is nothing but a posterior mean. There are many algorithms are available to decide on the right posterior mean. And uh, I have an example in the next sheet. I will uh, discuss that example. Uh, before going to that example, uh, let's discuss the method. Uh, many algorithms are there. One method is called MCMC method. What is an MCMC method? Uh, first MC stands for Monte Carlo. Anytime you draw samples from a population, uh, that is called a simulation in statistics terms. And uh, this uh, samples are uh, you know, uh, called Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, Monte Carlo is where gambling happens. Uh, so there they applied this uh, sampling technique. Uh, henceforth, it is called the Monte Carlo simulation. So that is the first MC. And uh, we always dis we already discussed, we'll aggregate the most recent mean with the new evidence and calculate the new mean. So whenever we take the most recent data and uh, arrive at a new statistic, uh, that technique in statistics is the Markov's approach. That is the Markov's approach. And we chain this. We saw how we chain the posterior, right? We assumed a prior, got a posterior, assumed the posterior as the new prior. We can get a new posterior. We can assume the new posterior as the prior. We can get a new posterior. So this chaining happens. So we always take the recent data and then you know, can consider the evidence, uh, calculate the new mean. So this is called the Markov chain. This is what MCMC method uh, uh, applies. This is what MCMC method is all about. Now, in MCMC method also, there are variants, many variants, uh, uh, you know, to consider uh, how to decide on what posterior is the right posterior. And one popular uh, technique is Metropolis Hastings. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, I will give a resource to learn about this technique a little later. Okay. And uh, as we decide on new posterior mean, we can arrive at a distribution. Uh, this distribution is going to reflect the reality. So we are deriving the distribution. We are not assuming the distribution. And henceforth, the derived distribution doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be uh, what uh, smooth or one peak. It could be any uh, different, uh, uh, any distinct distribution for that matter. Uh, so this is the philosophy behind Bayesian. Um, I will explain this Bayesian approach in Google Sheets. And then we will break for questions. Uh, we can uh, then proceed. OK, I'm sorry. Yes, so this is the sheets. 
uh, this sheet is available you can take it i'll give you the links in the end let me go to the uh, sheets first okay let's try to understand what is there in this sheets uh, before that uh, let me explain what the prior distributions look like uh, so i'll go and uh, remove the posterior okay let's assume a normal distribution let's start with the normal distribution let's say 30 is the mean and 5 is the standard deviation i'm expecting so your prior distribution is going to look like this so it's going to peak at 30 and uh, it's going to have the likelihood of other values let's say 29 is high likely compared to 20 and 35 is more likely compared to 40 uh, this is the prior distribution i'm assuming i will bring in the evidence and posterior and all that but uh, is this the only choice not necessarily uh, let's say i can assume a uniform distribution also in uniform distribution what are the parameters it is min and max are the parameters and i do reset between 10 and 50 i get or 10 and 40 i get equal probability of any sample the probability of getting a mean of 25 is same as the probability of getting a mean of 30 in continuous distribution this should be called likelihood let me call it likelihood of getting a mean is 25 is same as the likelihood of getting a mean 30 and the same as the likelihood of getting a mean 35 or 15 or 10 that's what the uniform prior means. So if you don't want normal distribution, if you don't want uniform distribution, but you have an idea of what a uh, distribution look, should look like, then you can go for gamma. Gamma has variety of uh, distribution shapes. If you, if you feel uh, for your use case, the distribution is going to be, uh, you know, only on the right uh, side of the, it's skewed. And there is very little chances the, uh, distribution will have a small mean then you can choose this or you can uh, go for a small number in the beta and see what happens you can see what is happening here it looks very similar let me make this smaller and see what happens see the distribution looks like this and if i make both same it should look somewhat symmetric if alpha and beta are same uh, I'm, I'm not showing a complete picture here. Let's make the number bigger. If alpha and beta are same, the distribution is going to be symmetric. Uh, why am I not seeing this? Um, so, yes, it's uh, not symmetric in this case. The number has to be higher and higher. Then it will be symmetric. Let's see if, I, if we are lucky now. No, we are not lucky now. If I make seven and seven, it's uh, not giving me expected, let's say 20 and 20. So we have to play with this and arrive at the uh, right parameters for our prior distribution. Uh, okay, let's say one and one. I think that will work. Oh, that also is not working, gamma distribution. Uh, I forgot what was the case. 20 and 5. Let's see what this distribution looks like. This distribution is skewed on the other side. So this is something you can play with and find the right uh, prior distribution for our use case. And if you have, uh, if your x values range between 0 and 1, then there is a special distribution called beta. Uh, this beta uh, will give you, uh, yeah, beta only if alpha and beta are same. And uh, then it will look symmetric. If alpha and beta are not same, it will look asymmetric. So here the x-axis will range from 0 to 1. If you want to estimate a value between 0 to 1, we use this beta distribution as the prior. And uh, we can design the beta distribution to be skewed or to be um, you know, uh, symmetric. Or for that matter, uh, it can be looking a weird distribution as well. Let's see what this distribution looks like. So uh, we we have a highest uh, probability that the probabilities will be small, very least probability the probabilities will be high. So this is one way of looking at it. So these are the four popular distributions, prior distributions. For those who are interested, I'll give you one more uh, input here. There is something called conjugate priors. 
please google conjugate priors and you can read more about priors these four are the commonly used priors in those cases now let's go to uniform distribution i expect my mean to be in the range of 10 to 50 and uh, this is what my prior is looking like and uh, the prior column is given here and the prior column says probability that the mean will be uh, less than 10 is 0 0.025 probability the mean will be between 10 and 10.4 is 0 0.025 this is the uniform distribution is everybody clear now that we have uh, we have got the assumed prior basically uniform prior means i have no idea what the distribution looks like i am letting the evidence decide what the distribution looks like if i have a, a normal prior then i have an idea this is where the mean is uh, concentrated on right so let us take a uh, mean uh, let us now i will generate samples now the sample i get this five sample says 26 27 31 23 25 and i get a sample mean that is 26.7 now my prior is saying all means are equally likely sample says 27 is what is going to be uh, is the uh, is the mean which we got it so we will revise the distribution of the uh, uh, you know mean so let me revise it let's see what happens okay i have to get the prior also in place um, uh, so i have to okay i have to go get one more chart let me get that line prior and then i'll add the evidence this is something we'll have to do it let me reset okay uh, yeah so this is the mean between 10 and 50 uh, so that's a uniform distribution and if you see the evidence evidence is saying 34 and our peak is at 34 okay this is evidence yes evidence so the peak here is at 34 now if i have to bring together the prior and evidence and calculate a posterior we know that prior and evidence it has to be multiplied right uh, if i can go to that slide in this uh, you see here prior and evidence is multiplied and we ensure all the posterior probabilities add to one that's what is happening here so the denominator is uh, exhaustive cases in our uh, use case since this is continuous distribution it's impossible to get the exhaustive cases so we have to normalize this prior and evidence to add to one prior and evidence will not add to one that's why i have a column which will add to one so let me bring the uh, let me bring the posterior also here uh, we will see we'll understand how the posterior looks like see the posterior distribution looks like this posterior and evidence look same because the prior is uniform and uh, posterior thing is it is going to add to one the area under the curve will be one in the red color area area under the red color curve will not be equal to one that's the thing now i aggregate posterior and prior i have done that now i can uh, create a new prior so if you notice here it's a point one two five is the prior and posterior uh, let me see yeah this is a case but our use case is in the end let me go here so you see the new posterior this will have to be replaced with this values let's see if i say revise what happens so uh, when i say revise uh, okay it calculated the new mean as well so you can see the posterior curve is uh, not skewed anymore and our prior is something here in the 40s and evidence is 18 the new evidence is 18 so the prior is in the 40s uh, the evidence is in the 18 and uh, we bring this two together our prior looks something like this not a skewed distribution um, but uh, a limited distribution let me revise it let me take this and put this in prior one more time and uh, you look at the prior and posterior let's do this few times we will have some interesting use cases yeah you see the second peak forming so it will keep forming new new peaks uh, it doesn't have to be uh, we'll we'll limit our focus only to the posterior so that uh, 
uh, we understand how the uh, i will remove the evidence i'll also remove the prior so the posterior distribution can be any uh, pattern so there can be two peaks there can be one peak it could be smooth it could be uh, you know skewed uh, that is the idea of the bayes now there is no assumption is this clear any questions on this sheet before i switch back to uh, slides you can unmute yourself i think all your mics are allowed you can unmute yourself and ask questions um i have a question yeah tell me uh, so like uh, how, how what makes us decide like how many times we should revise it okay uh, see a uh, bayes is meant for dynamic systems so any change has to be captured uh, if you want a thumb rule how many times you will have to revise it if your prior and posterior distributions are converging then you can stop let me get that scenario also let me get the uh, posterior also prior also added to this chart okay it may not happen immediately but see in this case it is converging it looks more or less same but if you stop here uh, you will have to continue to calculate posterior if that is not any different from prior you can leave the prior as is if it is different from prior you have to revise your posterior and another yeah thank you another question i have is in this case uh, we are assuming a prior like uh, distribution and yes. then uh, like particularly in this google sheet the evidence is collected based upon the prior right And like no the, evidence is not based on prior evidence is independent of prior so like uh, there must be like in, in this example for like per se the evidence uh, must be like coming from some function uh, like which is yes. as, so so that is something else in in this case yes evidence is something else evidence can come from binomial distribution evidence come from random distribution evidence can come from evidence is independent of prior prior okay. is because uh, we don't know what the reality is and the evidence is going to give us a flavor of a reality and then we bring together prior and evidence that's what is happening okay. and in an actual dynamic system the evidence will be the actual observed facts right yes uh, evidence will be the actual observed facts and that is not final because the observed facts could also be an outlier henceforth we also account the prior ah okay okay thank you so any other questions before we move on so this sheet is there i have given a link to this sheet uh, this sheet will come to you as a read only sheet uh, if you make a copy for yourself then i think uh, all the formulas everything should work revise button everything should work okay uh, i am switching back to slides we have one more slide to cover so we got this mean estimation from frequent test approach now we have a mean distribution estimate from the bayesian approach uh, we can do a, a comparative study right so, so this is where the sheets are available i will share this uh, links again in the end let's move on yes oh okay or do i go to the slide because yes and now that we know statistics calculated from the large pool of data is a frequentest way of calculating those statistics we can calculate probability we can calculate mean we can calculate the variance we can calculate uh, anything for that matter any statistics that's calculated can be calculated in two different approaches from now on one is frequentest approach another is bayesian approach in the frequent test approach uh, we need large pool of data whereas in the bayesian approach we can calculate from a sample of data we don't need large pool of data and the sample of data can be from the space the frequency domain or a time domain in a time series let's say we we calculated uh, average sales for the previous week now we have the average sales for the current week we can bring this two together 
to calculate the to predict the what the average sale is. That's what I mean by time domain. It's on the time series scale. And then frequentist approach, we assume the distribution, and then the Bayesian approach, we derive the distribution. That's the uh, fundamental difference between the frequentist and Bayesian. Now let's see what this gives rise to. The assumed distribution, which we which we assumed, gives rise to for the statistics. Now that we have assumed the distribution, it gives rise to standard deviation of the statistics. We can get the standard deviation of all the means. We can get the confidence intervals of the means, p-value, type one error, type two error, power of a test. Any statistics you calculate from distribution uh, is uh, you know is valid as long as the assumed distribution holds good. If the assumed distribution does not hold good, then uh, all the statistics which you calculate from the distribution are not dependable or not reliable. Uh, that is something uh, everybody should get it. Whereas in Bayesian, we calculate further statistics for the derived distribution. In this case, this distribution is going to reflect the reality. We calculated this distribution from the samples. That's uh, important. So uh, in this case, uh, the way we calculate the confidence interval is different compared to all the symmetric distributions or a well-defined distribution. So uh, the 95% probability is called uh, high probability density area. And uh, you know uh, everything is, uh, methodology is different, but uh, it will be dependable. That's the point. And uh, we discussed already this, right? It's suited for well-settled scenarios with normal distribution or a well-defined distribution. And the VAT changes are rare. Whereas uh, uh, Bayesian suits for dynamic systems, where changes or latest trends needs to be captured, or where limited data is available, where big picture is not captured, and the uh, disadvantages of this is compute intensive. You cannot calculate a mean and depend on it. We have to keep calculating it, and it's our decision if we want to consider the posterior or go with the prior. Uh, algorithms define different ways of doing things. So this is a bit compute intensive. This is the difference between the fundamental difference between the Bayesian and uh, frequentist. So in this slide, I've given some applications. Let's see, Bayesian can be applied to calculate any mathematical statistics or estimate. For example, mean variance probabilities. When we do it for mean variance probabilities, we do modeling. We do regression modeling. What are the estimates in the regression models? We have constant and uh, slopes or Regression coefficients, we call it. All the beta coefficients, all the beta coefficients can be Bayesian. And uh, time series techniques and clustering techniques can also use Bayesian. And in fact, uh, the industry is heading towards Bayesian techniques. Uh, slowly, uh, Bayesian techniques are gaining popularity, uh, but uh, the community had to be trained on Bayesian techniques. That is the right now challenges. And we, when we do deep learning, we have we calculate millions of parameters, at least thousands. If it is a small deep learning network, uh, in that case, uh, all thousand can be estimated using Bayesian. So, and uh, Bayesian is also applied in model selection. You have ten models, which model to go for? Uh, all that can be uh, applied. Uh, Bayesian can be applied, and the right model can be chosen. So it's all about prior evidence and posterior. And uh, you assume a model, you get a new model and see if the evidence is supporting the new model and go for it. So the applications are very, very widespread. And uh, there are popular algorithms, MCMC, variational inference, probabilistic graphical models. All of them are based on Bayesian approach and uh, if these algorithms are there any libraries which we can apply these algorithms on uh, which we can experiment these algorithms on yes there are libraries in python we have pymc 3 version and uh, it, this is the pymc 3 uh, documentation all the examples uh, you can see this pymc is pi monte carlo uh, simulations basically uh, you can see the Monte Carlo can be applied for linear regression, logistic regression, Poisson regression, and uh, uh, you know hierarchical model for prediction models, uh, t-values, diagnostics and model criticism, 
Gaussian process. It's very nicely put. All the examples have codes with them. You, uh, you can go into the codes and let's see here. This is all uh, um, variance reduction. Uh, these are all MCMC methods, mixture models, simulation based inference, survival analysis, time series analysis. You click on it, you get the code. Directly, code is available. So if you understand the philosophy of the Bayesian, you can make sense of this code. So PyMC is one of the well documented uh, uh, libraries. Uh, I would uh, recommend if you are a beginner, go to this PyMC. There are tutorials, there are examples, there are books and videos. A uh, lot of them are there. So that's about PyMC. Um, okay, where is my presentation? I think here only is my presentation. Yes. So similar to PyMC, if you are an R programmer or a MATLAB programmer, uh, there is uh, Stan is the library. Uh, Stan is available for Python, R, MATLAB, variety of the uh, uh, programming languages. Uh, and uh, it has good documentation as well. Uh, and a lot of YouTube tutorials if you want to look for. Stan is one of the popular uh, libraries. And these two for uh, you know uh, uh, normal machine learning problems, you can use these two. If you're going for deep learning and neural networks, TensorFlow has come up with its own uh, um, probabilistic framework uh, to apply Bayes. It's called TensorFlow probability. Uh, and uh, PyTorch also has a similar one. It's called pyro.ai. Uh, all the examples are available. Uh, you can go take a look at it. TensorFlow probability is for probabilistic reasoning. Probabilistic reasoning is nothing more than Bayesian reasoning. That's fine. So uh, and that's the uh, uh, applications. Now that uh, uh, we have applications, algorithms, and packages, we all understand what Bayesian stands for. It stands for a philosophy more than a formula. Uh, uh, we will uh, see what are the resources. Okay, I get back to this by mistake. What are the resources? In Devopedia, we have a lot of articles. I showcased a lot of NLP articles. We are about 40 plus NLP articles for you to read about. Uh, but pertaining to this particular topic of Bayesian inference, what will help you is probability for data scientists, Hypothesis testing and types of errors, A-B testing. I would recommend these three articles, go through them and uh, consider contributing your own version of articles as well. So this is a good uh, uh, you know, uh, starting point for you. If you're familiar with Bayesian philosophy and basic statistics, then you can consider these books. Think Bayes is the book. This is very Python intensive and uh, uh, you know, formula intensive, but I would say having considering that you have the Bayesian background, give it a casual reading. This has a lot of use cases. Ignore the programs, ignore the formulas, but it has about 20 plus use cases how Bayes is applied. How Bayes is applied for uh, mean estimation, probabilities, and uh, various examples. And the good thing is, all the codes are available for this book in this link. This is the Think Bayes latest version of the book. Go to the chapter one. You have the code in the GitHub repository or the collab repository. So you have all the code for, you know, uh, Alan Downey, the author of this book, has come up with the framework for uh, Bayes. You can use that framework also. This is different from PyMC and all that. Uh, using that framework, he has solved all the problems for all the chapters in this collab. Uh, uh, about 20 use cases, I would say. First two, three use cases will be very simple, but uh, from the fourth use case onwards, uh, they are very uh, intuitive, very, uh, uh, you know, explained use cases. I would say I suggest this book very strongly. And uh, this is also a very casual read, Bayesian statistics, the fun way. Uh, they will keep talking about prior evidence, posterior again and again in different scenarios. Uh, you can uh, do a casual read, and uh, this is a uh, you know this is using R and Stan. Um, this is a little in depth. 
book, Statistical Rethinking. And uh, if you, I think you can manage to find these books in the online, in the web itself. Otherwise, also these books uh, cost very less in Indian rupees, 200 rupees, 500 rupees, I suppose, if you want a hard copy. I have a hard copy of Thing Bayes. Uh, I purchased it for 256 rupees or something like that. You can, uh, there's the latest version of this book also is available. That's uh, if you want to read further on Bayes. Now, if you are a different uh, kind of a learner, let's say you want to watch and uh, uh, learn. Okay, again, I made a mistake by choosing the wrong key. If you want, if you learn from videos, if you're a person who likes to learn from videos, there are a lot of videos. I have tried to, uh, you know, uh, make it simple by ordering these videos. So which video to look for first and which video to look for later? Because we land in a uh, you know, high-end uh, complicated video, you might lose interest. So I would advise you go for this video from 3 blue, 1 brown. Uh, like we explained Bayes from basic probability using count the numbers. Bayes, you, this 3 blue, 1 brown uses a basic geometry to arrive at the Bayes uh, understanding. Uh, it's very basic geometry. It is going to be very easy. It's going to be numerator and denominator, the same things which we looked at. Uh, but it uses the geometry as the approach. Uh, and that is one thing you can start with. And this is a talk which is a fun-filled talk, how to quantify uncertainty. Bayes uh, is meant to quantify uncertainty. This is a fun-filled talk. Uh, this is something you can listen to when you're traveling or when you're having lunch or dinner. And there is nothing heavy in this talk. Uh, these two are very light, uh, you know, uh, light learning. There's nothing heavy in it. So this is where you should start with. I suggest, I recommend. And then these are the two uh, part video on to the Bayesian statistics. Uh, here uh, they explain this MCMC and Metropolis Hastings algorithm. Basically, the posterior is decided on two uh, recent posteriors. Uh, that's what Metropolis Hastings algorithm is all about. If you want to go a little deeper, you can decide on your prior distribution, posterior distribution, likelihood distribution. Likelihood is nothing but what we refer to as evidence. Uh, so uh, uh, wherever you see likelihood, you can uh, conveniently assume it as evidence. Uh, so prior evidence and posterior. That's what is happening here. And uh, this is from StataCorp. Uh, StataCorp is a statistical package like uh, uh, SPSS or Minitab or MATLAB for that matter. Uh, you can, if you're interested in learning Stata, that's fine. Um, but these two videos uh, will give you uh, somewhat uh, uh, inner workings of Bayesian, especially with respect to MCMC and the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. And this is the second uh, uh, set of videos you should look for. And the third set of videos, if you are interested in PyMC and if you're a Python uh, person, uh, then this video is what I would recommend. This is the beginner video, but a lot more examples are available in the link I have provided earlier. And if you want to apply Bayesian for deep learning, and this is again a fun-filled talk, though it says deep learning, and there is nothing heavy in this, uh, it's a high level fun filled talk. Uh, you can, this is a casual watch. This is a very uh, intensive watch, involved watch. This is going to be a casual watch for you. Uh, I would recommend these two as a next level uh, learning path for you. Uh, now comes the last one. If you are interested in understanding further on frequentist and Bayesian approach, I recommend these two talks. Uh, this is going to be much more involved. You will have to uh, listen to the talks again and again to appreciate the difference between Bayesian and frequentism. Uh, this is fun-filled talk. This is more of philosophical talk. Uh, you choose your uh, uh, timing and uh, go through these two videos. And beyond this, there are application level videos. You want to apply Bayesian for regression. You want to apply Bayesian for uh, deep learning or clustering. There are specific videos. Uh, which you can Google or YouTube after uh, uh, completing these videos. This is just a learning path because I assume most of you will be beginners in the Bayesian. Uh, so I thought I'll put this together for uh, the benefit of the community. Now, 
that's uh, the that's the content for the day um, so the slides are available here all of you can uh, download the slides this bitly uh, url has expiry date so if you want it in future i will put this link uh, in the youtube uh, 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 you know content we'll be loading this uh, talk in the youtube there in the comment section i will put this uh, uh, link for uh, the slides in future if you are uh, bit.ly has expired uh, so you can download the uh, slides from this bit.ly uh, uh, link and uh, for the um, for the sheet which we worked on you can download it from here i would uh, copy this for you and then put it in the last slide itself because both the links are available in This is the sheets. And this is the slides. Let's put it like this. So you can take the bit.ly uh, links and uh, 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 we are good now. You can ask any questions further. You can unmute yourself and ask questions. Yeah, hello. Is it audible? Yeah, audible. Yes. Yeah, I just want to quickly ask apart from uh, Python, are there mm -hmm. any good libraries available in JavaScript per se? So I that am... I can uh, uh, re readily see and uh, run in a browser. So how the JavaScript community or Julia, if you are aware of Julia programming language, Julia community is handling this. Yeah. JavaScript has TensorFlow modules. All the TensorFlow modules can be accessed in JavaScript. TensorFlow Lite, I think, or TensorFlow JS. Uh, you can use TensorFlow JS for JavaScript. I am not much well versed with Julia or Java for that matter. You can explore TensorFlow JavaScript, TensorFlow JS. Oh, thank you. Have a question. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> See, uh, my question is about, uh, see, there are different libraries, right? So you mm -hmm. have NumPy, you have Pandas, you have, uh, uh, as you said, uh, this thing R. So mm -hmm. there are different things, right? Mm -hmm. So in the industry, how mm -hmm. these things are used? So my question is like, so do they extract out the entire data out and then do the processing uh, separately or you have a uh, you know sort of like a dashboard which has all these things or which is being built uh, by you know uh, data scientist team or engineering team and then the uh, process at a you know at a every runtime and uh, <clears throat> get insights uh, hope i put my question clearly uh, i'm not very clear let me put my understanding then you can correct your question is around uh, how we choose the technology, how we choose Python or R or... Uh, no, 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 no. How it is, how it is actually implemented. So, <clears throat> how, okay. uh, how these Bayesian curves are actually implemented or uh, you have libraries. The libraries yes, libraries. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, they take out the data and then you have a set of data scientist team and then explore mm -hmm. slice and dice do all the play around with it get useful insights mm -hmm. or <clears throat> uh, you know there are a lot of dashboards which has all these capabilities mm -hmm. and uh, you know or they build a dashboard with these capabilities using the libraries and mm -hmm. uh, get what the insightful or useful insights <clears throat> okay so data is a separate piece our library comes as a separate piece so we use the library uh, for the data and generate insights. And uh, uh, dashboarding happens as the last step for the end user consumption. Otherwise, data scientists uh, will, uh, you know, 
uh, will will be comfortable in the coding environment and uh, iteratively uh, looking at the results and uh, does that answer your question yeah so where does this r is being used why do we use that r why r is a used? choice r is a choice between r and python uh, so if you're uh, if you want to use pymc you have to settle down with python okay. if you uh, and uh, if you're comfortable with r and people do this uh, uh, you know uh, analysis cost benefit analysis what whether support is available in r or python for stan Tan okay. support is available mostly in MATLAB, uh, okay. so they do this uh, cost and benefit analysis and the choice. Uh, choice is an important factor, and the decision making is on number of uh, factors. Okay. okay. <coughs> so, any other questions? Yeah, I have one question. Um, sure. Actually, um, uh, I mean, yes, I'm new to this Bayesian uh, reasoning mm -hmm. and uh, we are working on one uh, time series, uh, I mean, prediction problem mm -hmm. uh, where we are predicting, uh, say, like the water level of a reservoir mm -hmm. from uh, multiple features like uh, weather related or even the past data we have about the water levels in mm -hmm. over the last decade or so. So we did like as you know, you described the frequentist approach where uh, you know, we were uh, we, we just fitted an LSTM to it and mm -hmm. and it, it's giving pretty good results. But uh, you know, that's where I started learning about Bayesian approaches because uh, it it actually helps with the dynamic data in this case. Uh, Particularly, it's a time series, and uh, the the, it, the stationarity may be there currently, but over time it may not be there with the varied uses and things like that. Yes. So, uh, so like today's analysis, I mean today's lecture, it was very good. Thank you for that, and it mm -hmm. gave some like brief understanding of it. But uh, I'm still not clear about how it like how like how to start quick to apply to this. Um, you know, problem uh, mm -hmm. rather than going through an entire course and learning and then coming back to this. So, so is there a link or something that you can just, you know, uh, send to me, th which I can read through and uh, like kind of, uh, you know, uh, concentrate this effort and learn yes. that way? That is an example I remember. Uh, I forgot the example. Uh, one second, let me see if I can quickly look in the tutorials. Uh, deep dives, PyMC. Uh, I think this example is what it is. No, not this example. Uh, let me quickly Google it. Uh, PyMC. Uh, um, mean shift, I think, that happens over time. Um, this is a nice one, but linear regression is one. IMC for time series, let's Google that. That will be, I remember one example uh, for your This time series. I'm not getting it. Can you ping me separately? I will give you. Sure. I forgot sure. that example. PyMC estimate uh, uh, for mean shift. That's how that's so that happens over time. That's a, a typical time series thing. I'm not finding that. Uh, I'm not sure how to reach you uh, sure. because in the slides, the, your email or I mean, the thing is listed over there. Okay, I'll put it. You can reach out. rm.ramanathan at gmail.com. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, on the same yeah. line, I also have a quick question. Uh, 
as he mentioned about time series analysis uh, mm-hmm. speech uh, signal is a very time varying signal so i just mm-hmm. want to quickly know have you come across any example for bayesian inference on uh, speech uh, recognition speech processing speech signal processing you can uh, i can safely assume uh, all the signal processing or especially speech or uh, nlp for that matter uh, use bayes oh, i haven't okay. personally come i have not personally worked on speech data but uh, mm-hmm. text generation and all use bayes okay okay fine thank you for example if you go open your whatsapp and uh, mm. uh, if you open your friends whatsapp uh, the recommendation will be different let's say you have a habit of typing hi as hi your friend has a type of habit of typing h a h e y and mm-hmm. the recommendation for your friend will be h e y for you it will be h i and i mm-hmm. have noticed this okay i type it as okay my friend type it as okay a y uh, so this all accounts for your recent behavior and then provide recommendation oh, okay okay that is Right. You can so open two WhatsApps in parallel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they use. We can safely assume they use, and this is becoming the norm more and more. Uh, but uh, advanced applications use it. Uh, otherwise, community had to be trained. Fine. So, uh, if I have to see uh, in MATLAB, or because MATLAB have lot of modules for signal processing, so mm-hmm. in Python also there would be some modules for Bayesian and signal processing, right? Yes. Oh. Python is what I have given. A uh, MATLAB has TAN. Python has PyMC. If you, that's what you are looking for. A uh, MATLAB has a TAN as the library. You can look for TAN. Okay. Okay. Stan so I, uh, with the corpus of speech, I can try out uh, this thing as Bayesian. Then. Okay. Sure, sure. You should try out. Okay. okay so TAN is you. meant for here. Uh, they are given what all packages: R, right. Python, Shell, MATLAB, Julia, and Stata. Oh, okay. 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 Great. So, right. thank uh, you. Stan so. supports this five languages, six languages. I Somebody see. was asking for Julia. Uh, I was Stan only asking. <laughs> okay, you are thank asking. You. Sorry, thank I didn't see the name. Okay, fine. So, yeah, thank you. Stan is available thanks. for all this. Thanks, thanks. And uh, this video, Stata video, also uses Stan. This Stata video also uses Stan, if I am right. so good uh thanks for joining uh, you can make note of this uh, slides uh, for now and uh, my mail id also i have given in this uh, if you want to reach out 